up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Brutally Speaking, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net. I am your co-host, Dan, and with me, as always, is your not-quite-so-co-co-host, Mr. John Beatty. How are you doing this evening, sir? Hello, everybody. <laughs> He's being dragged along uh, through the muck and the mire. Uh, this is one of those episodes where, um, you know what, I decided to just do the interview and uh, left John completely out of it in the cold darkness. Actually, I don't know what you had going on that night. I think you were working, delivering groceries for old ladies or something like that. Yeah, I. Uh, here's a fun story. Uh, I am quitting my job. I'm quitting my day job, my 9 to 5, literally and figuratively, and I am going to be doing a grocery delivery service shipped as my main source of income so I can focus more on this podcast. That sounds amazing, and the best way to express that is to not be on an episode immediately after that. You know, uh, I but the thing is, is you know something we had talked about, uh, and as Dan kind of alluded to uh, just a second ago, we since changing the name from John's Untitled Podcast to the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I wanted there to be more of a fair representation of of Dan and I on these things. And actually, I will say, uh, we've been doing a lot better about having both of us be on these these interviews and so forth. A lot better than we had been previously. Um, I think it's just kind of the nice thing of the industry kind of being slowly getting back into fully kickstarting, so it's a little bit easier to to get on the few interviews we're doing. That being said, I also wanted Dan to have the to, to be able to take the initiative and get some of these interviews he was setting up himself. And Brandon, very much like the episode I did with Alfonso, I kind of had thought about being there, but the more I thought about it. You know, I, I heavily dominated the conversation with Alfonso because that's someone I've known for for very a very long time, and Dan and Brandon know each other. They you know they've met each other a couple of times or at least once uh, when Brandon was on tour. They've maintained the friendship. Dan was uh had recently had Brandon on the hundredth episode of Dan's other uh, podcast, the discography discussion, where they talked all things Norma Jean, or I should just say basically the first record for about forty five minutes and then uh forty five minutes on the rest of the discography. But uh That's enough of your negativity, John. That's not negativity. That's that's just a thing. If we want to talk about negativity, maybe I'll talk about how not only in this interview but the other one that you did with him, you guys bring up the fact that I left the Etid show and I must not be a big Etid fan at that point. We can't let it go, man. It's just uh it's just one of those things where it's a story that's worth telling over and over and over again, much to your chagrin. But, uh, you know, with, with all that aside, um, this was a pretty fun interview for me. Um, it was kind of a, a weird balance of wanting the listeners of the podcast to know about American Standards and know about Brandon and kind of get a little bit into his head as to what he's got going on over there in Arizona. Or his mouth. And, or his mouth. Or, I'm what? sorry, not his mouth. His mouth going into your mouth. Baby birding, as it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there was a story about baby birding, which I won't spoil here, but definitely disturbed me on a level I can't really describe. But uh, I did bring it up because uh, when he told me about it, I just felt like I needed to share that with the rest of the world. Uh, so you guys get that. We talk about um, talk a little bit about social media, bands having political stances, all kinds of good stuff. And, uh, you know, I definitely was about four to – six Elysians in whenever uh, we did that interview. And so it was a lot of fun uh, kind of just to kick back and uh, and just talk to a friend of mine because, uh, you know, we talk mostly on Messenger. So to, to get to just have that free flow conversation and it not have to be within the constraints of, hey, we need to talk about this band for eight hours, um, it just be kind of a more casual thing. So I, I hope you guys enjoy it. And, uh, you know, let us know in the comments or, 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 you know, whether you're listening on YouTube or whatever, if you want more Dan interviews or if you want Dan to quit or, uh, you know, I, I think we're probably just going to keep doing what we're doing regardless. But I do want to hear some uh, some constructive feedback if that does exist. Speaking to the YouTube comments, I actually got one today speaking to uh, somebody who had recently subscribed over there and left us a comment on actually my Instagram, our Instagram page. Uh, with the new logo that we dropped. That's right, you're probably going to notice there's a new logo uh, attached to this. Um, but the person said that basically they had just started finding us on YouTube and been listening to a couple episodes. And thanks to Dan's recommendation of the Space Dusts, has found a new favorite beer. Fantastic. I'm glad that there are fellow believers out there. I think Space Dust is, no pun intended, a rising star. Oh, I, would, and, I thought uh, you were going I for out of this world. everybody's... 
What's that? I, I thought you were very out of this world. <laughs> no, you're right. You're definitely right. Um, seriously, one of the best beers out there. If you haven't tried Space Dust, you need to. Just keep in mind that it's kind of like, you know, a, a really harsh tasting beer. And um, it has a very high alcohol content. So don't just drink like eight of them, you know, starting out or you're not going to be able to go to work tomorrow. And it's going to just be this big thing. So, you know, definitely drink it responsibly and um, but enjoy it. And, you know, comment. We one of the one of the biggest reasons we went in this more kind of alcohol focused direction on the podcast is not just because John and I are alcoholics, but really has more to do with. We just want to hear what other people's favorite beers are. We like to hear about, you know, drinks that we haven't heard of before. So uh, comments, you know, we, we, we want to hear from you guys. We want to hear, you know, what kind of beers you're drinking, what your favorite cocktails are. If you have an idea for a cocktail, shoot it to us, man. We'll try it out. Yeah, most definitely. I know I uh, currently am drinking, I think I talked about it really recently. I'm not a vodka drinker, but I am drinking a Kettle One Cucumber Mint uh, Botanical uh, Vodka. And uh, I'm mixing it with – ginger beer is usually a good one, and I, I went somewhere the other day and, and got the same drink, and someone looked at me like I was kind of foolish. Uh, and then they did the old uh, bartender trick where you put the straw in and take a sip and you know find figure out if you like it or if it's mixed well or whatever. And they're like, that's a, that's a really good drink. And I go, it's basically a cheap man's Moscow mule, but uh, it's, it's very good. Um, trying to watch my figure. <laughs> um, so I actually have this uh, – this new ginger beer I've never seen. It's no sugar. It's a zero calorie. It's a Ziva. It's okay. It, it it tastes like if someone were to be like, ginger beer. And you're like, yeah, I, I get that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to Dan's conversation with Brandon Kellum of American Standards, and we will talk to you guys afterwards. <laughs> Pleasure this evening of speaking with Mr. Brandon Kellum, lead vocalist of the band American Standards. How are you doing this evening? Doing pretty good, Dan. How about yourself, man? <laughs> doing good, man. I'm I'm recovering from uh, the snow apocalypse uh, that it's we're having crazy. here. And seen online when uh, all the stuff you've been going through with between you know the work and getting caught in the in the traffic with all the snow and everything. Uh, I definitely count my blessings for living in Arizona where it does not snow ever. Right. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say if you woke up one morning with 11 inches of snow on the ground, you'd be like, well, I guess uh, I guess the world's over. <laughs> yep, pretty much global warming wasn't a lie. Right, exactly. I'm like, how does global warming equate to snow exactly? But <laughs> Well, it's uh, what, I guess, what is it? My, my wife always tells me it's not uh, global warming necessarily, as it is just like a rapid climate change. There you go, yeah. I mean, the, the ice caps melt first, so I think it gets colder before it gets hotter. Oh, okay. I'm not a scientist, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I think you're a scientist, right? You know, I mean, you <laughs> studied things. Um, but I, I have to say a little bit uh, at the beginning of this inter- interview about uh, American Standards. Uh, American Standards, if you haven't heard them before, is a uh, chaotic, hardcore, spazcore, or as I re- heard somebody refer to it as on YouTube the other day, dead guy core. <laughs> You watched that uh, the Death of Metalcore video, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. I watched that the other day as well. Yeah, that guy's got some good videos, uh, but you know, calling a dead guy core really isn't too far off the mark. You know, I'll take it. Um, as uh, I still spin uh, fixation on a coworker. I mean, <laughs> pretty frequently, um, not around my coworkers, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it is pretty creepy. But um, Brandon, you've got. Um, a new song that everybody's going to get to hear at the end of this podcast. Um, and But I, before we talk about that one, I want to talk about the more recent single that you put out, which is a song called Weep. And um, if you guys haven't heard this yet, you can definitely check it out on American Standards Bandcamp page. Um, it's like the last big single. There's no record to go with it uh, yet, but check out that single. Uh, weep, and I just wanted to get a little bit more more of a perspective on it, as it seems to have a lot more 
influence from like older hardcore metalcore bands like you know your um i don't know like your old bleeding through um blood has been shed uh, a lot of those old like ferret records bands and stuff like i get a huge vibe from that um was that something that you guys like collectively were moving towards like it's still chaotic but like were you trying to move away from that like kind of norma gene every time i die sound to to get to kind of an older metalcore sound uh yeah no, not intentionally um i think really honestly the when we're when we're going into writing that song it was just about how can we first put a little more structure to what we're doing because i i think like uh cory will come to me he'll come to me with you know two dozen riffs and it's really kind of on me to figure out how we're going to structure those riffs Right. So with Weep, it was more about like, how do we build a solid structure out of these, you know, all these piles of riffs that Corey has. And I um, and I think as a result of that, it made the song sound a little more, maybe a little more cohesive. And like you said, maybe a little more like um, older school metal uh, metalcore, because uh, it does have that like it has more repetition than we typically do. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think we ever kind of go into it either saying like we're, we're going to sound like a Norma Jean song or we're going to sound like a Chariot song just like this is the stuff we used to listen to in you know the late 90s early 2000s and uh and surprisingly when we listen to heavy music it's still kind of that sound too you know sure just like the um more of the chaos more of the noise well that kind of leads into what my next question was too do you feel kind of like that that style has um aged well like in the sense that like people are still playing that kind of music now um or do you feel like people are kind of moving away from that um, I feel like it's always been like a tangent to whatever the mainstream style is. Mm-hmm. Meaning, um, I don't know that dead guy core or whatever you would call it, you know, yeah. uh, chaotic hardcore, math core. I don't, I don't know uh, that it's ever been the biggest um, like buzz genre. Um, yeah, there's been a few big bands from it, like you mentioned, you know, like Every Time I Die and Converge and everything. But they're never like the mainstream bands in the scene, like the mainstream metalcore bands or like when... Um, easy core got big or when melodic hardcore got big like chaotic hardcore never really had that um that spotlight in my opinion i do think like it kind of you know maybe if you were to say it peaked at some time it maybe peaked probably like 2004 2005 2006 around that time frame and it kind of maybe went down for a little bit or kind of went in hiding for a bit there's still bands doing it but nothing that was kind of uh breaking into mainstream and then more recently you know, over a decade later, it seems like there's a lot of bands that are coming up and starting to do it again. Um, you got like, uh, I don't know if you follow Mathcore Index online, but uh, yeah. every single week, yeah, every week they're putting out, you know, a, a dozen different bands or pushing a dozen different bands that are doing this kind of style of music. So it does seem like it's starting to take off again. I just don't think it's ever going to have the spot like it. Like, I don't think it's ever going to be where every band's trying to be uh, chaotic. It's just going to kind of uh, live on the fringe of it. Right. And is that is that discouraging to you at all, or is it kind of one of those like, no, now I've got room to kind of breathe, you know, and not have to worry about a keeping up with what's trendy, or b um, not have to worry about their like playing a show where like every band sounds like you. Yeah, no, actually, I I love it because I mean, just like you said, there's now like we get put on such a wide range of shows, you know, like one night we might be playing with like Emery. Um, yeah. Or the next night we might be playing with um, Winds of Plague and uh, Rings of Saturn. And we don't make sense on either of those shows, really. But sure. we kind of get a standout because of that. You know, it's not too often that we, we get to play with a band that sounds like us. Um, right. And if we do, it might be a band like Norma Jean or Every Time I Die. Um, on an anniversary I, tour. I don't know anybody in Arizona doing that style, you know. So it's it definitely helps us quite a bit. Right. Well, yeah, and you guys are kind of the uh, the kings of uh, jumping on anniversary shows <laughs> and uh, and it tours. It feels that way, man. Yeah, yeah. We, we've definitely lucked out over the last few years. Well, and that's something that when John and I are interviewing people a lot of time, we're like, you know, hey, you know, such and such record came out about 10 years ago. Are we, you know, <laughs> when's, when's that tour going to be, you know? And then a lot of the yeah. times if I think about it, I try to, I'll try to like message you or something and be like, hey, uh. <laughs> just so you know there's this 10 year anniversary tour coming yeah um yeah yeah no we've become the like obligatory um local band for the the 10 or 15 year anniversary which i mean it's cool because it's like these are honestly shows that we would go to ourselves 
Um, but it's also, it's kind of weird because like the, a lot of the people that go to those shows are like people that maybe haven't been going to shows for like the last 10 years. They either have kids or, you know, they're adults now and they're not really uh, listening to, um, the screaming music as often. Right. Um, so when we play those shows, um, although it's a show that we were going to probably be at anyways, it's not always the best show to build a new audience from because those people aren't there to go to a local band show the following Tuesday or something like that. Um, no, it's it's fun, but it's like kind of give and take. Yeah. Now I remember being local band myself for a long time and like you could get like everybody that you knew to come out to a show, you know, and you like, you could like, it was one of those crazy nights where you sold like 150 or 175 tickets or something. And you're like, well, we're clearly the best band in our town, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then the headliner rolls in or whatever. And, you know, you, like your friends and family are there to see you play or whatever. And then the next week you're like, Hey, we sold so many tickets. They're giving us our own headlining show next week. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then, you know, when that show comes, there's like what, 10 people there because everybody came and saw you the week before. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly, man. The, the struggle is real. It's now, like most bands, local bands, are struggling to pull 50 people, let alone uh, 150 people. Exactly. Well, and something that something that sets you guys apart uh, specifically, you know, with the amount of releases that you have and the, the history of the band, um, you guys are completely independent at this point. Yeah, is, man, is, it's a... If uh if you talk to somebody uh, on any of the socials, you're most likely talking to me. If you're uh yeah buying a T-shirt, you're probably going to see my address on the top left corner when you uh <laughs> when you get it in the mail. That's something that that's interesting now, um, because I know you know, and you, you've talked about this in other podcasts. Um, it, it, what you guys may not know is that Brandon has been on like literally every single podcast known to man. Um, if and, I listen to the podcast, I'm going to be on the podcast. Right at some point, it's like a like a bucket list thing. <laughs> And uh, I've had Brandon on several times on uh, my other podcast, Discography Discussion. And uh, what's interesting is um, I think everybody's heard the story, but you guys, when you started, uh, had a relationship with uh, Victory Record. Yeah, yeah, we actually were signed to a, um, I don't know if you'd call it a, a subset or an imprint of Victory Records, but a, a label called We Are Triumphant. And all of their distribution was done through Victory Records and all their promotion and kind of the groundwork or foundation of their label was built from that right and i'm not going to ask you to tell the exact same story over and over again but um i don't know maybe i will it's been a while since i've heard you on a podcast tell it so um (laughs) but as far as you know whenever you guys made the decision to go kind of more independent was that a decision that you made or was it one of those things where maybe you didn't have the label support that you wanted but you were just like well i'm actually doing pretty good anyway (laughs) Yeah, no, the funny thing is, like, the difference between being on the label and not being on the label, it was, there There really wasn't one. It was pretty much we, uh, when we first got the offer and we found out that, you know, Victory was going to be distributing it, we were like, this is a great opportunity, and we immediately thought it was probably, like, you know, fake. It was going to be, like, someone trying to uh, scam us or something. Sure. But um, luckily at the time, our, our guitarist, Brennan, or, um, he had a friend that was a lawyer, looked over to contract. We kind of reworked it a few times. Um, we did it where we only had to put out one album, so it wasn't you know a five-year deal or ten-year deal or multiple albums. Right. Uh, so we're like, you know, it can't hurt to get on the label. But as soon as we signed, outside of them, you know, distributing the, the album and maybe posting about us once or twice, you know, putting us up on their website, um, there really wasn't anything else from that. You know, they weren't giving us tour support. We were booking our own tours. Um, we were still paying to record our music. Um, they weren't even really giving us kind of guidance or direction on like who to work with or um, what we needed to grow. So it just wasn't any artist development. It was just all us still working on everything ourselves, which we were used to and we liked doing. Um, but the unfortunate thing about it was then they started asking us to start booking tours and helping get press for their other artists that were they were signing at the time. Yeah. Uh, so now we're doing twice the work. Um, oh. And by this time, you know, this is 2000, probably 11 or so. By this time, you know, the label already had kind of a uh, bad reputation. Um, so we started finding that, like, when we were playing shows, um, people would, you know, be trash talking the label, or some people didn't want to work with us just because we were associated with, with uh, We Are Triumphant and, and Victory wow. Records. Um, so we uh, were like, man, it's just hurting us at this point. We're, we're doing all the work ourselves. And a lot of people think the reason why we were getting anything that we we're getting, you know, getting the shows we were getting and getting the touring we were getting to press was because of the label. 
Right. So it's just like they're getting all the credit for it and we're doing all the work, so let's just cut ties. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, especially you know, the funny thing about it, I don't know if I've told you this story. Um, the funny thing about it is we, I mean, that's, like I said, that's what, eight years ago or so, seven or eight years ago. Yeah. We never really saw any any money from the label at all. Um, and after the first few months, I would say first three months, we stopped even getting sales reports. Um, and well, since huh. they are the ones that distributed the label, we didn't have any like insight into, you know, how many sales we had, how many streams or anything outside of what we can see kind of, you know, like anybody else that goes to Spotify or anything like that. Right. So I saw a, uh, a buddy in a, another band from the East Coast. He posts uh, online um, about how the label had screwed him over or screwed his band over. <laughs> Normally, I, I, I keep scrolling. I don't really uh, get involved in it. But for something something in me that they said, OK, I'm going to you know respond. I'm going to reply on here and kind of tell our story, which I haven't really you know been too vocal online about. It. I just don't feel like it's my place. Um, but no lie, within an hour of... Uh, you know, commenting on here and, a, you know, a bunch of people liking it and everything and sharing it. Um, I got an email from, from the owner of the label <laughs> and, uh, he sent me sales reports. He sent me a check, um, or PayPal, sorry. Um, PayPal me all the cash from like the last seven or eight years. Oh, wow. Um, and then he basically said, do you want to, do you either want to, um, own the rights to the, the album, which was still life still or, yeah. um, do you want to, ne- yeah, do you want to negotiate us keeping it? I said, no, we'll, 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 uh, definitely, you know, take the cash and just take the album, you know? Sure. And, uh, um, we just use that money to remaster the album and put it back up on, uh, all the streaming sites. Yeah. I was just going to say that, that, that you've got a, a remastered still life out there now. Um, that, that seems to admire your punch a lot better than the original, but you know, um, I may not have, yeah, uh, yeah. I may not have, uh, you know, always had the best quality on streaming, you know, anyway, I, I definitely need to, is there a way to get that on Bandcamp now? Or is that just, uh, is that just, yeah, you're right. Only? You know, we need to actually, now that I think of it, I don't think we uploaded the, uh, the new version to Bandcamp. So I need to take the old one down and put the new one up. Cause you're right. It's like, it's a lot louder. It sounds a lot more powerful. Um, if it were up to me, if we still had the, uh, the original stems from that album, we yeah. probably would have remixed it too, so done a remix and a remaster. Oh yeah, but uh, it's been so long, and we did that at a, a buddy studio, you know, sure. ten years ago. Um, so he just didn't, he didn't save the session, so we can we had no option to remix it. Right. And the uh, the interesting thing too is you know you were saying back in like 2011, you know, you were booking your own tours and everything, and you guys are you guys are still touring. Um, maybe yeah. not. Yeah, uh, man, it's 364 days a year. But what does that look like? You know, as far as far as the tour cycle goes for uh, for an independent band, it's um now it's kind of like what all the guys can commit to, which is um you know sometimes it, sometimes it's discouraging and frustrating because I would like to be out there a lot more than we are. Yeah. You know, I don't want to I don't want to go back to what we used to do or what I did in the band prior where we were booking, you know, several months out of the year. Um, I think the sweet spot is doing two or three weeks at a time, doing that every few months. Um, but we don't even do that, you know. Sometimes we're playing one or two local shows every couple months and then we're doing maybe a week of touring every few months. Right. Um but yeah, it's it's all based on what the guys can do. They all have day jobs. The band's definitely not, you know, um not the way that we pay our rent or anything like that. Um, which is good, you know, cause like, honestly, when it was the way that we paid our rent, um, for my, for my old bands, it's, it makes it more stressful. It just makes it another job, you know? So now it's just kind of on our terms. When we want to tour, we tour. When we don't want to tour, we don't, we don't go out there and grind. Um, so we don't get frustrated, you know, we're not right. out there playing to five people every single night and sleeping in our van. So when we tour, it's like, these are places we want to play at venues. We want to play with bands that we want to play with. It's sure. not, you know, we need to play this show. That way we can get to the state after that. And at this point, you don't feel like you're just, like, leaving money on the table by not grinding out, you know? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that there is any money on the table. Well, right that's now. true, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, like, with us at least, um, we, we've been lucky enough to never really have to go too far out of pocket. When mm-hmm. we record, we, you know, we pitch in for that. But for the most part, our T-shirts and our guarantees kind of fund everything. But we're pretty much at a point where we um, do just a little bit better than breaking even, you know. Sure. And, and you're right. I guess if we if we played more shows, we might make a little bit more money. Um, but it wouldn't be anything like it wouldn't be anything substantial enough to do anything more than just bump that money right back into uh, you know pressing T-shirts and recording. 
Well, and something I find interesting about American Standards that I don't see with a lot of a lot of self funded bands, you guys are always really on top of like the videos. I mean, almost every single time you release a single or whatever, there's always a video to go with it. And my understanding is that you have another video, yeah, yeah. for this, it, and it's for this new song, correct? Yeah, yeah, we're actually um, we're doing some reshoots right now, so I'm assuming by the time this comes out, uh, we'll very likely have uh, the video and probably premiered um but yeah yeah we're doing another video like my thing is music in general unfortunately and almost any type of art it really feels like it's um like we're we're in a a time where people just consume and then move on to the next thing right um you know they hear one song and then you know they hear probably 50 other songs that day uh so it doesn't live as long it doesn't have enough time to breathe so i figure like we're trying to do everything that we can just to give it the opportunity to um make it more memorable and i think the videos help you know i know when i'm looking at new music i'll pop over to youtube all the time and pull up you know whatever video or songs they have on them so um i think the videos let it do that it lets you uh connect to the song in a different way um especially with this new video we're kind of the reason why we're doing re- reshoots is we we shot the whole video uh we got the entire cut back and we looked at it and we said you know this just it doesn't resonate in the way that we wanted it to resonate mm-hmm. um and even if we had to push the song back, because we recorded this song, hell, probably five or six months ago now. Yeah. Um, and we wrote this song um, probably almost even before that. You know, we wrote this song. This We had the song ready to go when we came out. Yeah. Um, it was one of the two songs that we had at the time. But we just don't want to rush the video. You know, we want to make sure it's something that actually, like, we're all super stoked on. Well, and something I noticed, too, is that you've been releasing singles. Um, you know, whenever I first became aware of the band you know the the big thing the big push was for the full length which was uh anti-melody and uh you know i remember that record being you know kind of the main focus and then after that you know the 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 focus became more on like well let's get a single out you know you see you had the one with weep and then you've got the other single uh phantom limb you know is that um is that part of some kind of greater cohesive whole or are we just at a point where whenever you guys have a new song, you just kind of get it out to the listener uh, right away? Yeah. It's kind of um, a, uh, a practice and experimentation with different uh, producers and studios. Cause um, something I'll be like completely upfront with is uh, I don't think we've ever had the right studio that really fully realized the sound that we we're going for. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that I don't love like everything that we put out, you know, uh, like I love the songs, but I do think that there all, there's always something that's like in my head before we record it, that when, when it's actually, you know, um, set the tape, you know, and we released it, um, it's not exactly what I had in my head, you know? Sure. So what, what we've been doing now with, um, with Weep and, and Phantom Lamb and also the next song that we're working on here is we've just been trying to find the right person that can really kind of um, make make that sound exactly how we have it in our head, you know? Sure. I think Weep was great. We worked with uh, Hiram Hernandez. It's probably our best sounding song um, that we put out in terms of the actual um, production on it. You know, it's not it's not overproduced. It's not fake. You know, it's real drums and real instruments and all that type of stuff. But, um, but it still sounds a little more um, punchy and powerful than I think what we've done in the past. And then with this song, with Phantom Limb, uh, working with Greg from Dillinger Escape Plan, he um, he has a studio called Backroom Studios, and he he understands the sound, obviously. You know, he's recorded bands, uh, I mean, obviously Dillinger Escape Plan, but he's also done right. Foxy Shazam and Coheed and Cambria and uh, The Armed. So he knows the sound, um, and I think he's really helped us kind of realize what we can sound like with someone that knows how to do it. So in the future, um, once uh, Phantom Limb obviously goes on to make you billions of dollars in uh, in revenue, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, you know what? Are going forward, what are what can we expect out of American Standards as far as uh, are we going to get another single? Um, is there plans for like a limited release of something like uh, with with multiple songs, or or is it just kind of sticking with yeah. that until you, until you find the right sweet spot of not really committing to anything? Yeah, man, I like. I want to say that right now, um, at least with uh, Phantom Limb, I feel like we found it. You know, I think we've. It's, it was unique because we. So we, uh, uh, Mitch, our drummer, he engineered the song, so he's the one that actually, you know, mic'd everything up and recorded it. Um, then we took that and we sent it over to uh, Greg. He did the mix and the master on it, 
mm-hmm. and it allowed us to like kind of really take our time with it since we weren't like confined to you know we've got these two studio days and we've got to knock it all out in these two studio days it was like we sat on this song for so long for several months and um even when we thought it was done a few weeks later i, I would, would listen to it and I'd say oh, let me go in and try this or let me you know mess with this a little bit mm-hmm. um so i think that's kind of for me like the sweet spot i like i like being in a place where we had so much room to kind of really make sure the song was exactly what we wanted before we released it um so i think we're going to go forward we've got one more single that we're going to put out after this um we very likely will release um the three songs and maybe maybe do a fourth um on like a seven seven inch or um at least press it to something you know physical um and then after that i think we'll probably go back to doing another full length um and Very hopefully, cool. like uh, a longer, more substantial full length. You know, we call that anti melody uh, full length, but I, I mean, the runtime's probably got to be thirty minutes or less. I'm sure. So uh, twenty five uh, minutes. So so hopefully with the next one, there you go. You know yeah. better than I do. Yeah. So hopefully with the next one, we can make something a little bit longer, but also do it in a way that like we know that we've got the right producer, we know we've got the right person to mix it, and um, we can really spend our time instead of rushing with some studio hours. Definitely makes sense. So this is where I'm going to go a little bit off track. Is there a style of music that you've always wanted to play that you either can't play or have never had the opportunity to play? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, well, so when I... I, I'm like a guitar player, man. Like, I, I never expected to sing for a band at sure, all. Sure, yeah. Um, I played guitar for maybe 20 years, and in my first few bands, I was playing guitar. Um, I really only started singing for a band, kind of like everybody always says, like out of necessity. Um, so, you know, some guys, uh, I was re- writing and recording my own stuff solo and recording with a friend, and um, some guys stumbled, stumbled across it and basically said, hey, we want to turn this into a full band. Um, and I was the only one in the band that could scream, so the, you know they asked me if I wanted to do the vocals for it, and that was a hostage situation. Yeah, did you do? Um, uh, you did so backup that, vocals though, always, right? That's how you got into screaming. Yeah, yeah, I did a little bit of backup vocals for the uh, even like before that when I was doing Verilin and and Moose Script Inning. It's always like a little bit, but it wasn't a hostage when I was really doing it. And that's kind of um, we we wanted to do the more fun, kind of like the more tongue in cheek version of um, of Every Time I Die. Right. Uh, with with maybe a little bit like mailing and sons of disaster he is legend that's kind of what we were going for uh, but honestly, so southern music from arizona band, exactly yes yeah, southern music from arizona that's nice. with a fake accent and everything you know mm-hmm. um but what i wanted to do back then was i wanted to do something more like zeo or like mortal treason um or carcass or haste today like i wanted to do something with that really really raspy vocal um and that's actually like that's where my sweet spot when I actually, um, you know, if I'm doing that, I can scream like that all day and not lose my voice with American standards. Like I'm shredding my voice yelling at the top of my lungs. Right. So, um, so I would love to do something like that or I'd love to do something really weird, more like, um, fear before the March of flames and fall of Troy, that type of, uh, oh, yeah. kind of spazzy, um, experimental hardcore. You could throw some helium in there and do some blood brothers. You know, that would be awesome, too. I mean, yeah. let's bring back the two vocal bands. Honestly, you, you probably noticed with Phantom Limb and, and Weep also, to some extent, I'm really pushing Corey as much as I can to uh, to get his vocals on the tracks. Yeah, because uh, I love having like multiple layers of vocals. And, and this song, more than anything, I'm I'm probably only screaming 60 percent of the song and the rest of it's uh, all Corey. Right. And there's uh there's cleans too, uh, which w- which kind of uh, threw me off a little bit. Not that there hasn't been cleans in, in, in your songs out, before, we but sold yeah. Out. I mean, then the synthesizer comes in, <laughs> the disco beat, and at that point, I'm completely lost. But I felt <laughs> like I had an obligation. I had to do this interview anyway, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but what's uh? Yeah, no, it's crazy with the with the cleans. I actually, um, I don't know if I told you this on the side when I sent you the song, but um that was like something I had this melody in my head and, uh, and we put it to tape. And at this time, Corey and the other guys, um, no one else had heard it yet. Mm-hmm. And I had like, I had kept it for about a week cause I didn't want to send it, you know, uh, through an email or a text and them hear it like that for the first time. Right. So it wasn't until they actually came to, uh, Mitch's little home studio, um, that we all were in the same room and then they heard it for the first time. And I think Corey, I don't know if he hated it or, it just like you, it kind of really threw him off, but um, but it grew on him really quickly. So yeah. I could tell in his face right away, like he was kind of in shock because I don't think he was expecting that to be in that um, that part of the song. Right. Um, but yeah, he I think he likes it a lot right now. It just took a little bit for him to uh, to kind of settle into it. 
Do you ever feel like, you know, when, when we're talking about these bands, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, like Zayo and Mortal Treason and Haste the Day. And, like, we're, we're definitely dating ourselves, even, like, throwing some of those band names out there. Hey, are you ever at some of these shows yeah. and you're just kind of looking around and you're like, have, are any, have any of the people here been alive as long as I've been making music? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's always the time where someone comes back by the merch booth and they say, you know, you sound like XYZ band. And it's mm-hmm. a band that I haven't heard, or it's a band that's relatively new. You know, now like people will say we sound a little like Vane or like Knock Loose. Yeah, and, um, right. I'm like, I'm like we, we've been doing it for like you know last ten years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love those bands. Don't get me wrong. Those guys I are the babies. I love them because yeah. they sound kind of like those their bands. Yeah. Um, the funniest though, by far funniest, is we played with um, was it First Blood and who else was it? Um, Lionheart. Uh, mm-hmm. a couple of months back and these these girls come into the merch booth and they're like can you believe it these guys are in their 30s playing this music still I'm like <laughs> yeah gross 30 Ugh. years old disgusting i think they just assumed that i was younger you know right yeah you do have that face um one of the things that you introduced a term to me that i hadn't really heard before at least not in this context on your most recent tour, you toured with a band. What was their? What were they called? Steak Sauce Mustache. Yeah, and yeah, nuts, man. this is going back a little bit, like maybe like a year. But like you were like, man, I really, I did some regrettable things uh, at this show. And <laughs> one of the things that you said was that you ended up baby birding something into someone's mouth um, in the crowd. That was on so night one, I, man. I just need to hear. I just need to hear more about that. I feel like the people listening need to know about the art of baby birding jesus christ just really disgust people like make sure if you're uh eating right now you kind of set it aside for a bit no definitely but, like um, definitely yeah like especially if it's like raw eggs we played at a, yeah we, we played at a venue in um i think it was in washington that day one of the tour we had just met these guys takes us must add in person i've um, been talking to them online for a while but met them in person um and we were all going pretty hard before our set at the uh, at the bar, and and so was really everybody. I think everybody in attendance was a little more than trashed, but especially this one person, uh, because I'm up on stage. The stage is maybe three five feet high, and uh, and I jump across and I'm kind of running across a uh, like a pole basically that's beside these tables. And there's like people sitting in the table. Some of them are drinking and eating and everything, kind of like a bar setting. And uh, there's this girl that's eating, uh, you know, pizza. So I grab the slice of pizza from her, and I just stuff this whole pizza in my face. You know, I'm chewing down the pizza. I run back to the stage. I like, you know, do a little front flip on the stage, and I'm trying to, you know, chew the pizza quick enough that I can get to the next line of the song and scream the next line of the song. And I see, like, out of the corner of my eye, a guy is in the very front stage, and he's opening his mouth and pointing towards his mouth. So for some reason, something in me right away said, you've got to baby bird this pizza into this man's mouth. And he is asking for it for some reason. <laughs> uh, so once again, I'm sure the alcohol uh, was flooding with this guy all night. Um, so I proceeded to to baby bird to spit out the uh, chewed up pizza into his mouth, which he then ate and um, enthusiastically gave me a high five. Did he buy a shirt afterwards? I feel like he's <laughs> contractually know, uh, I, I obligated to a buy shirt, a shirt. But I can't. I can't remember to be honest. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! <laughs> that was the weird thing because it was so funny because yeah, we were so talking I, about something totally mundane, and then you just throw that out there, and I was like, "Damn, Brandon, I got to live casual. with that." Yeah, I got to live with that for the rest of the day now. <laughs> and it has stuck like with I said, me ever since. That was since. the first impression that Steak Sauce Mustache had of us. Um, and then I think they proceeded to every night we would go back and forth and see who can do the most ridiculous thing on stage. And who, uh, who won? You know, I, I would love to say it was American Standards, but those guys are crazy. Um, they've got this new bit where they play their whole show wearing diapers, and then behind them they have a huge projection of Teletubbies with their face superimposed on them. Um, so okay, they're, so they're it's doing like terrifying. Some of the weird stuff out there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's very creepy. Would you say that uh, baby birding is the weirdest thing you've done on tour that you're willing to talk about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, that that I can talk about is uh, probably the the key there. Yes. Um. Damn. I don't know. I might have to come back. I might have to come back to that. I'm sure I've done a lot weirder stuff on tour, but um, 
that I mean, yeah, that one was definitely up there. I want to get a little bit more back on track here, but uh, one of the things that I've I've wondered, or something that I noticed about early American standards music versus modern, is uh, there's always been kind of like a little bit of a societal. I don't want to say political because it's not really political, but like a societal commentary uh, throughout the lyrics. Where I've noticed kind of on "Weep" and "Phantom Limb," you've gone definitely in a much more personal direction. Uh, not that she didn't have personal songs before, but it wasn't like the over overarching prevailing theme. And I could just be picking apart two songs a little too much here. But uh, was that it? Was that like a conscious direction change? No, or... no, that's super fair, actually. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're right, man. I think uh, it was kind of unique when we first started writing music. Because, um, you know, this is we got together towards the end of 2010, early 2011. And um, when we first started writing, there was so much of a like I remember, honestly, like being downtown in downtown Phoenix the whole Occupy Phoenix movement was going and like the Occupy movements across the, the country yeah. where there's just protesters everywhere. So every day going into work, you know, walking through lines of protesters downtown, um, just there's so much crazy stuff. And what the uh, sad thing is 10 years later and all that's probably amplified now, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was just so prevalent. Um, and it just made sense to write about it. You know, I think um, I've always been like the kind of guy, at least, since I've uh, been screaming for a band that like, I never wanted to write like a love song. Like, I don't feel like I have a whole lot um, to add to that conversation because I feel like there's been so many uh, people that have done it already, you know? Sure. So, so this was just kind of my way of like writing about something that to me, like really meant something, you know? And it wasn't to, um, it wasn't to tell people like, Hey, this is what I believe and you need to believe it too. It was just more of like kind of questioning the stuff. Sure. Um, when we released uh, Anti Melody, Anti Melody, I think, I went really heavy handed with that, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But the funny thing is, the funny thing is, the singles on Anti Melody, you know, I, I don't know that I regret it, but the singles on Anti Melody were probably the least um, social commentary or social political songs, um, being you know, Writers Block Party and Carpe Diem Tomorrow, right? Um, compared to other songs like Broken Culture and. Um, church burner which are are pretty heavy into it you know yeah so we really absolutely. leaned into it with anti-melody um and then to your point we put out weep and weep was the first time that um i didn't write you know 100 percent of the lyrics right. uh cory took you know i'd say 80 percent of that song and wrote it himself when it comes to the lyrics and he was going through a super tough time in a, a, a long-term relationship with someone that he was living with that they uh they broke up and they you know he had something to say and i said you know use this platform to say it um, sure. so i think, I think that's where that kind of is switched you know we almost went from one extreme being anti-melody to very very personal with weep um and then now with phantom limb being um maybe not as personal but still to some extent um to some extent fairly more personal than than the stuff before it so I don't yeah. think it's um, a conscious thing to say we're not going to do what we used to do, but it's absolutely like, um, you know, what we feel at the time is what we're going to talk about. You know, it's um, we don't want to like kind of peg ourselves in any type of hole and say we're a political band or we are this type of band. I do think it's funny though. I don't know if you saw a while back, uh, someone tagged us on this um, this map of the United States and it was like the most political band in the United States, one band for each state. Mm -hmm. And uh, was apparently based on how often that band name kind of is uh, found, like in an online search with the word political. And somehow, so I have no clue how uh, American Standards made it for Arizona. Oh, wow. Um, among other bands, like all these other states had bands like Rage Against the Machine and, you know, bands that obvious system of a down, bands that obviously make sense for that. And then right. somehow we were the most political band in the state of Arizona. I have no clue how that happened. Hey man, you gotta take whatever kind of publicity you can get. Now you gotta live up to that. <laughs> yeah, right now I feel bad because, like, I—I I mean, not that I don't talk about politics, but um, you know, I don't—I don't ever try if uh, I don't ever try to push it on anybody. You know, it's, it's like uh, you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. But if you don't, you know, I'm not like Zach Del Rocco where I'm out there like, you know, kind of shoving my ideas down people's throats. But more power to the people that can do that. You know. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely takes uh, takes a little bit of uh, guts in order to do that, especially in our 2019 climate of, 
whatever opinion you have is wrong. You know, whatever facts you think you have are wrong. You know, like it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It's terrifying, really. And I, I could totally understand that if a band were to drop the political tag completely because it's almost almost akin to committing career suicide in that everybody is so divisive about everything. It's almost like if you take the wrong stance, like, is there a wrong stance? I like, I guess if you believe in it, it's not really a wrong or wrong stance. It's just what you believe in. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a little yeah. terrifying, um, these days where sometimes you're being attacked maybe not even necessarily for what you say, but how you say it or how similar it is to what a terrible person have has said in the past. Like you have to almost have all of these, um, different perspectives going at once before you can make an actual statement about something yeah right and then as soon as you say whatever it is um or post whatever it is you almost live and die by that because when people see it it's black and white there's no gray in it um if you're claiming a certain ideology or anything like that you kind of take all the good and bad of that even if you don't believe or identify with the bad parts of it um, so yeah, it's a scary place to be in, man. And I, I think something you said is like, it's super, um, smart because it's like, honestly, I think when, when someone doesn't believe what you believe, I think you still need to remember that like, whatever they believe, there's some reason that they think that's true and what's best for them or what's best for other, other people. Right. Yeah. Like no one like does something cause they're like purposely trying to be evil and everything. I mean, I guess there are some people <laughs> that do that, but, uh, yeah, there's for the a most few. part, like people aren't super villains, right? <laughs> yes. For the most part, people aren't super villains. So like when you, when you, uh, when someone believes something that there's something that like, you know, they, something that identified with them that made them feel that way. Um, and by antagonizing them, um, that doesn't make them, you know, listen to what you're saying or make them believe what you believe. Uh, so I think there has to be a different approach. And then there's, you know, obviously certain extremes of everything. So, like, there's different things you have to do for different situations. But for the most place, I, I would say, like, people are inherently good um, for, for the mo- most part, you know? Yeah, everybody's the protagonist in their in their own movie. You know, they're, they're the good guy, uh, you know, in either yeah, and, a world and, of bad guys or, you know, <laughs> or what, but. Yeah, and, and I mean, like I said, it's it's crazy too. It's like I see like my friends that like people that I've known forever when they uh, they post something standing up for something they believe in, and then yeah, I see the uh, you know the hundred comments of hate that they get because of it, um, or I see them saying something that I don't necessarily agree with, and it might hit me in the gut right away. Yeah, but I've got to remember, hey, like they're just a person too, and there's something behind that, you know. Um, we're kind of living in a time where like there's literally like a headline, and then you you immediately react without even looking into it. Well, and speaking to that, you know, there was a situation a few months ago where a member of a pretty prominent band uh, said something about um, somebody wearing a specific, like, a shirt with a specific political slogan on it is, like, not welcome at their shows. And anybody who knows anything knows what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to, like, sling the names. And then uh, and then another, another member of a prominent band, you know, said – on on twitter i don't know if it was on twitter or facebook or what but you said like everybody's welcome to come to our shows and then but it's like because that band that that guy was in was a christian band like people basically just like went to town on him like and made all these associations you know (laughs) about him based on his you know religion or 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 whatever it was and it was just such a such a shit show you know and um it, uh, that's just that's got to be so terrifying whenever you're making any type of political commentary at all. So I guess I had assumed, you know, based on my question about, you know, did you go more personal feelings for a reason or not? I, I guess I had just assumed that it was because you just can't do social commentary anymore, you know? Yeah, no, I, I hope not. I just like um, I think what I have this what I had to say or what I have to say and almost what we're talking about is um that's kind of, you know, that, that lives right now on anti-melody for me. And I still very much believe with everything, uh, believe in everything that, that, uh, we did with that album. Um, I do kind of going back to like how we picked the singles. Sometimes I wish we would have led with a single like church burner, which, um, I think is, you know, like a really important message. It's kind of what we're talking about now. Um, but since it didn't, like, I almost wonder, like, people it's not very often that people like you know ask or talk about some some of those songs on that album and and um and and kind of bring up how political or 
sociopolitical or whatever you want to call it, they are. Because um, I think, you know, Writer's Block Party kind of got the biggest push on it and Carpe Diem Tomorrow and maybe Danger Music. Oh, man, Danger Music, That's uh, that one's up there uh for me but yeah what's uh we still play that song every show too and that's uh it's funny i think we play danger music uh number nine more than we play the singles from that album well it's like a minute and 20 seconds or something right like it's not like a huge time investment <laughs> you know we but, can kind of sneak it in anywhere you know yeah if you want to throw in like four or five punches before the end of the show i mean there there you go um in wrapping up do you guys have any plans as far as when the video drops for phantom limb and and the uh the single is officially released. Um, do you guys have any plans to uh, to go out and support it on the road, like anywhere? Uh, obviously, I know you're not coming towards me, which I was really upset about because I'm that guy that's always like, Poof, no St. Louis dates. You Someday, know. man. Bro. Yeah, every time I talk to you, I tell you we'll, we'll have something sooner or later. It's unfortunately been later. But, um, yeah, no, we've got the – so the song's going to drop on February 1st. Um, we're shooting to get the music video out by February 15th. Is kind of the plan, and then we're going to go on a short run. Um, like I said, it's kind of hard to call it a tour because it's five days. I hate to be the guy that says, like, hey, come check us out. We're going on tour, and it's like, you know, a weekend tour or something. Uh, right. But we are doing, a, it's actually um, on the 22nd of February, we're doing Albuquerque at Eclipse. Uh, the 23rd of February, is Dem- Denver at Seventh Circle Music Collective, which is one of my favorite music venues uh, in the States. It's a really cool DIY venue. This guy named Aaron runs it. They, they treat us too well every time we go there. And actually, going back to Danger Music, um, if you've seen the live video of that, um, that's actually where it was shot at. Yeah, um, it looks like it was shot on a self- VHS tape. It was, actually. It's, so it, it's The beginning of it is actually, like I think, some After Effects or something. But mm-hmm. it truly was shot on this huge, um, you know, old-school VHS camcorder. Um, so all the graininess and everything is actually because it was pretty horrible recording, but purposefully, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, after Denver on the 24th of February, we go to Salt Lake City and play the loading dock. And then on the 25th, we're playing in Vegas at the dive bar. Uh, we also, I don't know when this, uh, episode is going to go live, but we also just announced a cool show back home on February 1st with Acidies Burn. Um, so it's going to be kind of oh, cool to cool. see them again. Um, they were just we played in with them way back in the days. So kind of full circle now. Yeah, yes. no, I'm excited about that. But, and then outside of that, so the video actually, uh, it's kind of a little funny story on the video. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I sent it to you. Yet. I'll send it to you, but I just saw Norma Jean release their new music music video a couple of days ago for that. Um, was it uh, Children of the Dead song? Yeah, that was a terrifying. And video. I was so bummed. I was so bummed that they released that video before ours, because ours um, actually centers around a guy running through the forest. Oh yeah. And I'm like, God damn it! Like we had this record. Yeah, we had this recorded like about a month and a half, two months ago. Um, but we've just been working on the subplot for it. Right. And then I saw the video come out. I'm like, that looks very similar to what we have. And now it's going to get p- compared to that. And, you know, honestly, if I didn't say anything, no one would probably know the difference or even bring it up. No, um, you'd get a message from Corey but, um, being like, Dude. I definitely know when I saw it. I'm like, shit, that's very similar. Yeah. <laughs> He'll send you a message. Hey, dude, I mean, come on. You know? Yeah, kind of funny. Yeah. Brandon, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find American Standards pretty much everywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Amazon. Best place to support us is probably Bandcamp. That's where the most money goes back to us, uh, especially if you pick up merch. That's kind of the way that we help fund our tours and fund our uh, recording. So, yeah, that'd be super awesome and really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time out, man. You uh, have yourself a wonderful evening. You too, man. Always a pleasure to talk to you. So that was Dan's chat with Brandon Kellum of American Standards. And uh, actually, I guess you should have started this off so you could ask me what I thought of yeah, it. Yeah, because I was. You're gonna be. Yeah, you're gonna be like. So Dan, what do you think of that chat? I'm keeping that well, in, by I the think way. It's the best. <laughs> well, I did the interview, John. So I guess it's my turn to ask you. What do you think of that chat? I did really actually enjoy the conversation. Um, Brandon is someone I I've actually become, I guess, f- internet friends is the best way to put it. Uh, through the every time I die Facebook group and. Uh, Man, I took a lot of L's on on the Every Time I Die show bullshit this week. Uh, 
you guys ripped on me three weeks ago, but also ripped on me <laughs> in real time <laughs> uh, on the 100th episode of the discography discussion for that. Then uh, Mike from Light the Torch, uh, he announced a couple of shows that they're doing, and I made a comment about, like, oh, I might have to drive out to, to Milwaukee to come see you guys. And he goes, oh, hopefully you get re- hopefully you don't leave because you may not get readmitted back in. And it's like, man, what the fuck? And then you guys brought it up on this episode as well during this chat, and I was like, man, I'm just taking L's all across the board on this. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of low and mean, but, it, you know, it is funny if it didn't happen to you. <laughs> I guess it's the only, um, but you know, back to, back to the, my conversation with Brandon, you know, it, that was a lot of fun because, you know, I've known the dude for a long time, but I just kind of felt like maybe there were things going on with the band that a lot of our listeners may not be aware of. And I think that we were able to do that, but also have ridiculous conversations about him dropping chewed food into a, uh, another person's mouth at a show and that person apparently like swallowed it and uh was into that and i guess goes to shows expecting that sort of thing that being said american standards is actually dropping a new single called phantom limb and i've heard it because you know perks of being a podcaster you know besides you know all the money that we people just throw at us on a daily basis i have heard the single it is amazing and if you guys listen all the way to the end of this podcast, you'll get to hear the single as well. And if you would like to keep up with Brandon Kellum, you can find him on Facebook. Well, just search his name. It's it's the one you see on this episode's notes. Uh, so just do that. Uh, if you would like to keep up with him on Instagram, it's very simple. Brandon Kellum. Again, just type in his name. Uh, he doesn't have a Twitter from what I could find. I think he just uses the American Standard Twitter. And uh, if you would like to find American Standards, you can find them on Facebook at American Standards. Same on Instagram. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Twitter, it's American, S-T-N-D-R-D-S. Uh, all that aside, if you would like to keep up with Metal Nexus, who is bringing you this podcast, you can find them on MetalNexus.net. Keep up with all the latest news, music reviews, and so much more. And you can find them on Facebook at Metal Nexus, Instagram at Metal.Nexus, Twitter at Metal underscore Nexus. And if you would like to keep up with Dan, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. You can find me on Facebook under Daniel Terry. Just search my name, and I will pop up for you. Not at your house. Maybe at your house. If you live close, maybe. But uh, you can also send me an email at discussmetaldan at gmail.com. And uh, you can find my other podcast, Discography Discussion, at discussmetal.com. And if you would like to keep up with all things the podcast, you can find us on Facebook at Brutally Speaking. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Bruce Speak Pod. And if you would like to email us, you can email us at BrutallySpeaking at gmail.com. And keep up with our sponsor, The Bean Bastard. We are in the midst of figuring out what the fuck we're going to do with all these goodies that they have sent us. Uh, we want to do a contest. We are in the midst of figuring that out. We're thinking it's going to be something simple like, you know, tag them... Like our like their page, like our page, tag us both in a post, and we'll draw winners from there. Uh, you know, rating and reviewing on uh, iTunes, and maybe something as simple as uh, subscribing to us on YouTube. Uh, we have a delicious Bruce Lee coffee blend. It is a uh, stone fruit caramel and kiwi medium roast up for grabs. We have a coffee scrub. That is also up for grabs. Smells very delicious. I wanna I actually want to use it. I, I probably have to buy my own here pretty soon. And we have a, an espresso hand poured soy wax candle also up for grabs. Uh, so Dan and I are gonna kind of discuss a little bit more about how we're gonna do this. Uh, if we're gonna give you the option of you know picking whoever wins gets to pick what they want, or if we're just gonna deem a prize based on what we think is worth more. Um, but we're gonna get, we have some awesome stuff from the Bean Bastard. So go to thebeanbastard.com. Look at all the products they have. Like we said, they got coffee, they have candles, they have body scrubs. Uh, they're actually working on a bourbon barrel uh, body scrub, I believe, right now. Um, just a great local, locally sourced coffee company out of Buffalo, New York. Great dudes. Um, can't thank them enough for sending us stuff. They keep us uh, laced up with the greatest coffee. Dan, I got to send you some. I have your bag sitting right next to me. Uh, and if you would like to keep up with them on the various socials and see what they're doing, you can go to the Bean Bastard. On Facebook and Instagram, simple enough. Uh, let them know that we sent you over here at Brutally Speaking Podcast. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. And we're going to end this episode as we used to 
with the new song Phantom Limb by American Standards. If you like this, I believe it's going to be on Spotify, Apple iTunes, all of that stuff. Uh, you can probably purchase this song over on the Bandcamp page. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we will talk to you guys next time. Hey,